Mellon Greenland Ambassador for a long time, um, and I'm delighted to tell you that she is probably one of the few Renaissance women alive. Just about everything she does, she does well. I didn't like her so much, that would be disgusting. Uh, <laughs> uh, she is a woman of many talents, many varied talents, and I think you're going to see some of that tonight. Her PhD was in 18th century British literature, but she has specialties in post-colonial theory, um, in feminism, which is a delight, especially Arab feminism. And I'm going to go to my notes to make sure I don't miss anything because her accolades are many. And the intersections of ethnicity, race, and gender in the Arab world. She's taught at universities in Texas and South Carolina, and she now is teaching at TCU in Fort Worth. We're so glad you're back. <laughs> Dr. Abinasser Dr. is the Arab language editor and translator for Jeff and Ann Vandermeer's upcoming collection of international experimental fiction. She's also the author of the blog, Rima the Arab Girl where she has done an absolutely stellar job of explaining the Arab Spring and other Middle Eastern events to those of us that uh, are having a little trouble understanding what's going on there. When she isn't lecturing, translating, writing, she can be found retweeting the Arab Revolution under the handle at R. Abinasser. Please pull it up and see what you get. She's also a good cook. And a, a dog lover for excellence. <laughs> okay, if you wanted that, I'm going to put it on the board uh, as soon as we're done tonight. Remind me. Uh, yes, and tonight we're fortunate enough to hear her presentation, Blind Spots, Feminism, Nationalism, and Revolution in the Arab World. Please give a warm Women's Studies welcome. <laughs> Uh, and we've 
have this, you know, uh, forcibly veiled, forcibly married against her will and completely invisible woman on one side. Uh, and then you have the uh, hypersexualized, lascivious, available woman on the other. Uh, and if these are the two main extremes that appear, both in Western and Eastern um, uh, literatures, then we have to ask ourselves where the real Arab woman falls, somewhere in between these. Um, <coughs> because uh, my training is primarily in language and literature, I like to start with naming, with phrases that are meant to categorize. Uh, in English, we have very clear distinctions. You know, when we say feminine, we know that we're talking about anything that things that have to do generally with women. But when we talk about feminists or feminism, we're looking at a specific ideological discourse, a framework within which we can talk about and discuss uh, women's issues and uh, the substantive arguments and discussions that are happening uh, among the women themselves and among the, people, the men and women largely within their societies. Uh, in Arabic, the term for women and the term for feminine the term nisa'i, which means uh, other pertaining to women, and nisa'iya, uh, which means feminine. There is no uh, separate word that indicates feminism as a discourse. As of this moment, there is no word in Arabic that signals a separate discourse that has to do with women's issues and women's discourse. Uh, we have to be careful, though, because we're talking about this act of recovery. We need to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of assuming that because something is label that it doesn't exist. And this is a trap that you see both in Western discourses and in Eastern discourses that are talking about and dealing with women's issues in the Arab world. The assumption that it is something that simply has never existed because it has no label. Um, Margot Badran, who is a scholar, uh, an Egyptian feminist scholar, uh, has made an important distinction between what she categorizes as invisible and visible uh, and she uses this as a means of essentially saving that discourse that hasn't been named from invisibility, uh, or from, let's say, anonymity rather than invisibility. Uh, what, she's what, what she means by this distinction is that feminism um, exists even in those historical moments when it's silent. And so what she's pointing to within the history of, say, Egypt specifically, which is her um, uh, uh, area of study, is that uh, there are moments when either the overarching patriarchal structure silences or limits or completely outlaws public discourse. And there are also private moments within families where you have fathers or brothers who silence individual discourse, or individual feminist assertion and discourse within the family. The argument that Badran makes is that during those periods, for example, the, the period between the 1950s and the 1970s in Egypt, feminist discourse was still around, even though it 